Hello everyone. Hope you're having a great virtual VM world 2020 and welcome to this session which is the top 10 Workspace ONE tips and tricks. My name is Joel West and I'm a cloud solutions architect with Hydra 1303. Uh, you guys have seen this uh, disclaimer slide a million times. We're not going to talk about anything um, NDA or pre-release in this session. Uh, we're going to focus our time today on really just looking at lessons learned over the last few years with um, deploying digital workspace solutions, particularly things that we've learned uh, this year in 2020 with COVID and uh, more people than ever. Um, and for a while, just nearly everybody that was still working uh, working remote. I want to take just a minute to talk about customer experience and customer success. So in digital workspace solutions, the end user experience has always been a primary business driver here in the modern management era. So that's not really something new to you if you're in end user computing. But from businesses and partners, um, this idea of really giving uh, the customer that white glove experience from beginning to end is really a focus now uh, of every enterprise and certainly VMware as well. Um, any company and VMware included doesn't want to do just one thing well, say we do great on education and training, but our consulting and our deployment, right, and how we care about our customer success and setting them up to be able to scale and be successful in the future. Right, if we didn't do a great job at that, it doesn't really matter if one of the things is good and the others are bad. We want to focus on everything and have a great customer experience uh, on every part of the business. So our agenda is uh, a little misleading, so I just did the top 10 tips and tricks uh, to get your attention. Um, what I'm really going to do is focus on what I call the four pillars. Right, so the four pillars are what deployment type makes sense, uh, identity management and authentication, partner integration, and then endpoints and onboarding. So you're actually going to get way more than 10 tips and tricks. All right? um, I've really found that if you focus on these four pillars, um, it helps address different pain points in pre-deployment and even after deployment or taking a mature uh, customer that's had endpoint management, even going back to just uh, MDM, and saying, all right, how do we transition this now to really manage everything? And are there things that we can change or fix or clean up? And uh, so when you really look at each one of these four pillars, it helps uncover uh, those ideas and concepts. All right, most of you guys that know me have been in my classes or have been with me in a customer engagement know that I do not uh, like slides and I do not use slides. I whiteboard 99% of the time. Um, I do that for several reasons. Uh, so I'll just give you my little two minute commercial here. Um, if you have a slide deck, right, it's a fixed discussion. Many times we need to take discussions in the ways that our students or the ways that our customers need to go. So you need to be able to change on the fly and discuss what people want to talk about rather than talk about what you want to talk about, right? That's what's important. All right, so let's recall all of the components and so that we just kind of start from a good point here. So if I'm looking at a digital workspace solution, all right, there's several components here. So we've got UEM, we've got Access, we've got Horizon, and Really, if we want to be complete about this, uh, we want to look at intelligence. And I'll sort of put off as a second row here, carbon black. And then other integrations. All right. So if I kind of use those as my solution components, there's a few things here that we have choice. So with UEM, right, SaaS or on-premise. Access could be SaaS, on-premise. Same thing with Horizon. Intelligence, SaaS only. Carbon Black, 
again, I think really to get the best out of this SaaS, there is some on-premise type deployments of this, but to really take um, advantage of the whole vulnerability engine and all the collection points, I think really scaling that out um, to a SaaS based. And, and if you're not familiar with that, SaaS is just really cloud. We use those terms uh, interchangeably. And also think too that, you know, Carbon Black and Intelligence have a direct integration. Really makes sense probably to keep same to same. And maybe um, that's a way to look at this is, you know, what makes sense for you. If you're primarily an on-premises customer, um, you know, you could do UEM access and Horizon as on-premises, but intelligence, right, you have no choice. So when you start getting into things that you don't have a choice, and then you have solution components that relate, maybe keep same to same on those, and that'll help drive um, some of this logic. And we'll, we'll discuss some other things that are decision makers as well. But then your other integrations, most of these are SaaS, right? There are some that could be on-premise, but most of them are SaaS. So we're talking about, you know, Okta um, applications like Salesforce, etc. So a lot of those are going to be SaaS based solutions. There could be some on-premises components. Um, there could be some off the shelf apps that you buy and deploy in your own data center. Um, it, it just could be a variety of things. But if I look at these subsets of items, You know, maybe it makes sense to just stay cloud with all of those because again, it's same to same. So then you got to make a decision about UEM access or horizon. And again, a lot of it might be, what are you doing today? Some interesting statistics that have come um, out of the cloud report. So uh, the 2019 hybrid cloud business value report um, gave us some interesting return points here. Of the customers interviewed, 16% said that they were going to stay uh, on premises. 7% said that they were going to go 100% cloud. So now that leaves you with about 77% that are going to be hybrid. So what I have drawn up here, if we decided to go on premises with UEM access and horizon, we now would have a hybrid solution because these other components would be cloud based. So you know, you're not in a bad spot because that's where a lot of the other world uh, is today anyway. So that 77% that are hybrid, 45% right are already there. So 77% said that they expected they would be hybrid. A subset of those said 45% were already full-blown hybrid, we're already doing this. So the first point around which deployment makes sense would be around looking at your business model and what makes sense for you. And as I said, if you end up saying hybrid, right, that's not a bad spot to be in. There's a lot of customers that are in the same boat with you. But let's look at something else here. So another deciding factor would be, you know, your, your DR strategy. So those customers that said that they want to go, that 7% that said we want to go 100% cloud, right? They're saying, I don't want to take the overhead of my own data center resources, worrying about configuring um, DR, even DR as a service where, you know, I've got my on-premises data center, but maybe my failover is DR as a service and this is cloud, All right? A lot of customers do that where, again, even their solution for DR is hybrid. But in that case, if I'm 100% cloud, I've got a, usually a business driver or a business outcome around that. The 16% that are on-premises, again, they usually have a business driver about this. This may be regulations. Um, this may be a, a geographic reason, right? We, we know in some parts of the world, uh, the cloud-based model just hasn't 
taken on yet, right? They're behind technology a little bit, don't quite understand cloud. Um, there's not a lot of cloud offerings, right? In some areas of the world, cloud is brand new, is, is, a, is an offering. It wasn't a service in that particular geo until recently. So there's a lot of reasons around that. But I think the biggest thing here is, is DR and for digital workspace, HA. So let's think about this. You're changing your sort of your whole model of your end user to where your end user now is going to have to hit access for everything. So if you go on premises, right, you better have a DR strategy because this could just bring everything down. Now, again, these 16%. They're already doing HA and DR. They've been doing this. They're longtime customers of ours, or maybe they're using, um, you know, Site Recovery Manager. Maybe they're using DR as a service, right? Whatever. They're they're longtime customers, decades long, and doing their own data centers and having their own recovery methodologies, and, and even you know, utilizing things like uh, vSAN to prevent uh, failures on storage, right? On and on and on. They don't have any single point of failure. They're great at doing it. And that's not a problem. But with digital workspace, right, a lot of times there's there's a decoupling between that digital workspace team and the infrastructure team. And the infrastructure team a lot of times does not want to deal with end user computing at all. And they don't want to deal with these other components. And that's why, again, even going back to the AirWatch days, that it was a cloud based solution. And the reason for that is, is that if I go cloud-based with access and I go cloud-based with UEM, then I always have access to that. And again, if there's a, if there's a decoupling here between my desktop team and the infrastructure team, it doesn't affect end user access. It doesn't affect uh, end user work time. And in the case of we've seen the COVID, we could just overnight have everybody work remote because it doesn't really matter, right? If we were an on-premises customer, I'll give you an example. We had several banks that were not set up with a lot of their employees to work remote. They don't. They didn't even have laptops, right, or tablets or anything. So they didn't even have the equipment, all right. So that really, you know, creates a huge problem when I'm not even set up to do it, uh, much less from the access and the infrastructure being cloud-based to where the users don't even have endpoints. But that's the history behind um, why um, the UEM pieces were always cloud-based because a lot of times those customers, and particularly if we go back several years, um, they were kind of on their own having to do MDM without the infrastructure team um, working with them. And so that's why it became a cloud-based strategy because those folks didn't have access to the data center anyway. So there was no way for me to deploy the, the components I needed, much less manage them. But besides DR, there's also scale. So if we say this is the number two reason to look at, the number one reason to look at would be DR and HA. And what we mean by scale is we've have customers, again, that have overnight had to go from, say, 20,000 devices to 200,000 devices. And that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, upper management says, hey, uh, we've been managing these mobile endpoints with a great solution. Can we manage our Windows 10 laptops and Macs with this? Well, yes, of course, absolutely we can. All right, what are we using three or four different solutions for? Bring everything under Workspace ONE. <laughs> okay, cool. We can do that, but again, you gotta be able to scale. Extremely easy to scale in a cloud-based deployment. Or for reasons like COVID, again, literally overnight, everybody became remote and you had to have those scaling capabilities. An on-premises customer is a very difficult um, way, reason for doing that um, you know, without a lot of build out of the infrastructure. So I can't just do it overnight. Maybe I don't have the physical infrastructure to support this. 
So I've got to build out the physical infrastructure first. And again, even things like going on site during COVID, those are very difficult things to do. Whereas if everything's cloud-based, right, I've got my administrative access uh, from my laptop wherever I am and I can fix things easily. So you can kind of see what happens here. We, we could say we could do some of the things on premises, but really what it boils down to is that our primary management components like intelligence, carbon black and our partner solutions are nearly either 100% SaaS or almost 100% SaaS. Then UEM and access, unless you have direct integration with the infrastructure team to help you manage this and handle DR, you need to go SaaS on that. So it really just leaves one thing, which is Horizon. And Horizon, again, is the same choice. Do you have the infrastructure? Can you scale? Do you have DR and HA sorted out? Right, those are questions. If you don't, Right, a really quick way to do desktops, you know, again, literally overnight is cloud. So desktop as a service, right? That's a, a great solution. And really what it comes down to, if you had time to make the choice, the difference between these two a lot of times is cost. If you've got the infrastructure, right, it's probably gonna be cheaper on a certain scale to run them on premises. But if you don't have the infrastructure, particularly if you need them overnight, um, cloud is a great option because I can deploy these and many of our different partners that VMware has um, and have desktops overnight without having to have the infrastructure. If I did a cost analysis, you know, between the two, it, it might be a little more expensive. It just depends on what it is. But you have to weigh in uh, business continuity here. If you bring in business continuity, then a lot of times the cost just goes out the window. So with COVID, for instance, hey, um, it's... Wednesday, we found out that everything's gonna be shut down. How are we gonna attack business on Monday morning? Well, right, your desktop team could deploy this in the cloud, literally, you know, over those few days that you had, no problem. And on Monday, everybody's up and running on their desktops being hosted out in one of the cloud providers. So cost sometimes becomes uh, a little less of a pain point when we bring in business continuity and lost revenue due to workers not having access to the resources that they need. All right, so looking at identity management and authentication, we can kind of break this up into two columns. So with identity management and authentication, once again, just like we talked about with what deployment makes sense, we need to look at here um, sort of what the customer has. We rarely go into a customer that's a complete greenfield deployment, right? That's awesome if it is, because it's like, we don't have any dirty laundry to deal with. We don't have any of this other stuff. Uh, we don't have all these other conditions. And we can just design right right out of the gate what the best solution is with the customer without any um, preceding issues, right? That rarely ever happens. So with IDM, you know, what do you have now? So, you know, what does your Active Directory look like? Um, do you have other identity managers? So do you have Okta? Have you configured anything with ADFS? Maybe you've got ping, right? There's all sorts of things coming into here now. And with Active Directory in particular, many times this is a great time and a great opportunity for customers to clean up. Right? We've had Active Directory for three decades. What does this look like? Are right, I coming back to old, old directory services even before Active Directory and a Microsoft solution? Um, what does this look like? Does it need to be cleaned up? Can we just reorganize all this? Maybe we've done a bunch of mergers and acquisitions over the last several years, and it's just kind of a nightmare. This is a time that many of our customers take opportunity to say, you know, this is we've really wanted to do this, but it's such a huge exercise that you know we had a hard time making a justification for it. This is a great time to do this because when you have a very complex identity source, right, a lot of identity sources, if you go into authentication, we have to take a look at that because with our users, right, when they're hitting access, there's several things that come into play here. It could be location. 
So that's the whole idea behind that network prefix that is on um, a policy in access. Could be location. A lot of times we don't uh, utilize that. Um, some of our customers that have um, devices that stay um, in locations like a branch, um, it's a great uh, use case for that. But most of the time people are all over the place. So we don't do that. But we also, but we look at platform, right? So is there a different access flow or even things that you're allowed to have access to based on the type of endpoint that you're coming from? But then, you know, who is your uh, identity source? So what has been federated into access? So all this really says is, where are your users? Right? And of course, then we're applying whatever permission to that is, which essentially is what apps or desktops or in an apps, we're going to include virtual apps along with that. Um, do they get access to? So again, this is something that could be really complex. Could I support right, all of these things being integrated into Access and deal with a really complicated um, authentication design? Yes, you can, right? But the, I guess the better question is why? Uh, when we talk about partner integrations in a minute, we'll, we'll make another discussion with that because this is what might help you clean some of this up because whatever happens, you have to have user alignment across these systems. So multiple systems, multiple SaaS based apps, multiple identity formats, right? Whatever's happening, um, the number one reason for user authentication failure, right? Really has to do with um, the fact that um, we didn't have user alignment. So it's not the expected user format and maybe uh, one of the systems doesn't understand this and that's what results in the authentication failure or you just don't have um, whatever that identity source is properly integrated into um, access. And so again, uh, it's just going to fail because of that. All right. So that's probably, uh, that's a whole set of tips and tricks right there. The first thing is we can talk to customers or if you're a customer yourself. What do we have now? Is all that necessary? How can we clean this up? Because really what you want is you want to meet your objectives but you want to keep it as simple as possible. Right? Don't make it any more complicated than is necessary because that's going to make troubleshooting really difficult. All right? So it's kind of too heads of the coin here. You might not be able to do a whole lot with your identity management scheme, right? Maybe you have to keep some of these things. Maybe you can't take the opportunity to clean this up as much as you'd like to. Do what you can, but then over in Access, realize that we have the capability, right, of integrating multiple IDPs. I can have multiple IDPs over here, right? And that's what's going to save you because I can have an access methodology and design for each IDP. So like I said, is it possible to support a really complex scheme here? Sure, but don't do that unless you really have to. But the nice thing is we do have the toolbox and the tools um, to do whatever we need to do. All right, so the third thing is looking at partner integration. And partner integration and identity and access management, right? There's, there's a good bit of overlap here. So let's start off with taking um, maybe a typical customer. So if we look at a typical customer, a typical customer, right, is going to have potentially Active Directory, right? Just regular, normal Active Directory that they've been using, right, as part of their solution. Well, if they're a Microsoft customer, of course, that means that they have Office 365. If you've got Office 365, right, you've also got Azure. So now this gives us some options, and this is some of the things that we want to talk about. So like I said, there's some overlap between partner integration 
and uh, identity and access management. Because if this is what we started out with, then this makes it easy here to, to do some alignment. So UEM and access, if I wanted to you know, start my integration with my digital workspace, so we've got the uh, old AirWatch Cloud Connector, just we usually call it the Cloud Connector these days. And that would allow me to get users into UEM. We could integrate Azure into UEM. So maybe this is kind of step one, step two. So that's all done under the directory services integration in UEM. And what's important here is understanding all right, this user alignment. And I'm going to use the same color here so we, we, we stress what's going on. So we've got user alignment um, across here. And of course, one thing you could do, and I'll just do it um, sort of as a dotted line. It's not required. But we could use the Azure AD connector once again to synchronize my on-premises directory service with Azure. Um, and again, the nice thing about that is, is that now you've got everything synchronized. And of course, what a lot of customers are looking at is if I want to move as much to cloud as I can, or for whatever reason, maybe that's how my business model is changing to maybe shrink the size a little bit of our on-premises resources. Uh, it still makes sense sometimes to keep certain things on premises. You can make, you know, justifications for a lot of that stuff. But we want to move as much stuff as we can um, to the cloud. This allows you a real seamless way to do that. But this also gives you some other options that we're going to talk about in our last section um, with endpoints and onboarding. All right, then we'd have uh, one other solution here, which would be our access connector. And again. This is going to give us our users down into access. So even though this would be maybe step three in the process, right, this one is critical. Because this is where our users log in, right? So remember, I've got a user here. Well, what are they logging into, right? They're logging into access. So those users have to be there. But you notice the user alignment across all of this. Um, by also doing this and essentially um, doing this piece on Azure, if I take Azure, right, and I integrate this into Access as a provisioning application, this now can help handle my onboarding. So, you know, again, Azure, oh, sorry, this should be Office 365. All right, so I integrate Office 365 into Access as a provisioning application. Um, this now uh, sort of allows me to help speed the onboarding because if I've got a user, and if we think about this um, just from a flow perspective, if I've got, uh, let's say I've got a new hire. And they're smiling, right, because they just started, so they don't know what they're in for yet. So I've got a new hire, and we, they've got an endpoint. And let's take the case that this was not um, staged. So if I have um, the capability and the time, a lot of times we'll take the um, tools that we have across our different platforms to stage things. So maybe I'm using Apple Business Management, or we've got Android Enterprise, or maybe I'm ordering my uh, Windows 10 um, laptops from Dell, right? And I've given the PBKG file, everything's all done. But in a worst case, maybe I just drop ship them this laptop. So let's kind of look at, you know, worst case scenario, of what might happen here is that we could uh, now have some other choices in onboarding. You know, we could certainly have them uh, go out to get WS1, um, download the appropriate app. But uh, another way of doing this is that once they hit access,
and they select Office 365. This is a provisioning application, right? So because this is now tightly integrated, so we've got Office 365, and of course we have UEM here that has been integrated with Azure. I guess I should do these as clouds, maybe make that a little bit easier. Then now, right, what happens is Office 365 directly comes back and they've got immediate access here to Office 365. So if you think about I'm a new hire, you know, what does everybody need access to immediately to get everything else done? They need access to email. So this gives you a great way of being able to do that. And again, because I've got my user alignment now across the four kind of critical platforms. So my original directory services, right, that's still on-premises, um, my cloud-based directory services at Azure, and I've got the proper integrations done at both UEM and Access. Um, this is a great way to think about um, looking at, uh, you know, a partner integration to solve onboarding and to also sort of solve uh, my Access. And it, and it really starts you thinking about um, user alignment. This is to me, the easiest use case around user alignment because it's using things that everybody already has. If you think about how many Workspace ONE customers or how many potential Workspace ONE customers have Office 365? Well, nearly everybody. So this is something that just about everyone could take advantage of. And um, it's a pretty cool way to make sure that um, everybody has access. Of course, you're gonna put Office 365 in the portal anyway. But if you set that up as a provisioning application, it can help with your onboarding um, should you need that. And again, a lot of lessons learned from COVID. We didn't always have uh, all the stuff set up ahead of time. And if we did, it just gives us so much redundancy and resiliency that we could just continue on without uh, any issues whatsoever. Um, at VMware, they were already set up to do this, as were several of their customers. And uh, those customers, right, really didn't experience any downtime at all. It's like, <laughs> hey, from now on, everybody's working remote. Okay. Doesn't really make any change except uh, the place that I am, right? As long as I have access, we're good. But another important part here about partner integrations is looking at other identity management solutions. So another real common solution here is Workspace ONE. and Okta. So what ends up happening here is that, you know, Okta has thousands and thousands of application integration partners. And, and you know, what are they, right? They, they are an IDM. And Workspace ONE is an IDM plus endpoint management. And Okta has been doing this longer. So they got more application partners. And as a result of that, customers who were looking for right um, the SaaS based solution before Workspace ONE right had all the pieces parts together after the AirWatch integration they would have um, used Okta so maybe you have a customer that needs the endpoint integration but they've already got Okta so once again this goes back to the first section when we're talking about um, what deployment type makes sense um, and a lot of this also addresses the business outcome of end user experience, right? End user experience is the top business outcome just about um, besides, you know, things that affect revenue today. So that being the case, if my users were already used to logging into Okta, I'm gonna, I'm gonna serve up all my applications from there. The only thing I really need to do now is provide device trust. Right. And so, again, that idea of device trust is where we would integrate Workspace ONE uh, into Okta. So this is a whole thing of who's going to be on the front end. If the customer hadn't been using Okta um, as much or maybe it's new or, um, you know, just looking at lifecycle management, are things going to change? Um, that's where you might um, look at um, doing one of two things. So there's two potential solutions here.
me choose another color for this. Uh, we'll, let's do it this way. So if I had Workspace One, UEM, of course, right, is handling my endpoints. But then we've got access. If this is going to be the primary mode of access, meaning that my end users, right, are gonna log into access. Well, all right, then if we've got application that came from Okta, we don't wanna create confusion here. So in this part of the solution, we would take Okta and integrate it into Access as an application source. So in the portal, you would just see a variety of apps. And the end user, of course, wouldn't really know where those come from, nor do we want them to. So, you know, maybe this desktop, right, comes from our Horizon integration. And maybe I've got an app that comes from here, but then the rest of these, right, come from Okta. End user doesn't know the difference and it allows us to have a seamless experience. I can still leverage everything that I've got set up in Okta. Um, it's very easy to add apps into Okta because of the number of uh, partner integrations that they have. The workflow is really easy. Uh, we could continue to use both solutions. So <clears throat> the use case here is we're gonna continue to use both, but we're gonna use Workspace ONE as our front end. So that's one potential solution, but that's not really uh, the one that we see most of the times in this use case. So most of the time, what we see here is if the customer had Okta in place, they're just going to continue right to use that the users will log into Okta where the difference is is that we integrate workspace one as an IDP into Okta and of course UEM is what's providing the device management and device trust so what ends up actually happening in the application uh, flow here, in the, sorry, in the authentication flow, is that right, whatever your user credential authentication method is, that's kind of still used on the front end, but what ends up happening is that we get a go, no-go from Workspace ONE on device compliance. And that's done because this whole procedure right here is set up as an IDP routing rule in Okta. All right, so we have an IDP routing rule that uses Workspace ONE as an IDP to evaluate um, the user. Now, the other cool thing is, is that what if I come in here and I do my Horizon integration, whatever it is, into Workspace ONE, right? This can also be an app source. So over in the Okta portal, you could have your desktops, right, that came from Horizon. So we could still provide that seamless solution. And this is a little bit more practical use case, just because if the customer is already using Okta, unless we would decide we were just gonna upset everybody and change the whole workflow, Right, we're probably gonna keep Okta on the front end, but we're gonna use Workspace ONE to provide the critical pieces that are missing, right? Which would be, uh, once again, endpoint management, device trust, and maybe my desktop resources if I was gonna do a direct integration into Workspace ONE. All right, so the last thing here is endpoints and onboarding. So let's talk about onboarding first. We discussed two things already. Things could be staged. And when we say staged, again, think about all the variety of options here. Um, this could be barcode, 
QR code for my rugged devices. This could be Apple Business Management, Android Enterprise for my mobiles. This could be um, laptop um, imaging. Say from Dell, so Dell offers a service, right, where you can provide that PPKG file um, where, again, it's essentially your image, even with domain join if you want to. And maybe our Macs, we'll just say that for Apple Business Management. So we, we talked about that. Um, and, and again, that might be the way we go about it if we have control over the situation. But if I didn't have control over the situation and we found ourselves kind of um, cut off and, and without necessary time, like we have with COVID, right? The easiest uh, part of onboarding is that end users can do this themselves, right? So we've got a user and they've got their device. So just think about this. This could be a COVID issue or this could be Mac, right? Mac users are admins. They're used to installing and doing things themselves. So we've had success, right, in both of these scenarios. So I've got an endpoint that isn't managed and I need to get that managed, right? And users can do this themselves very quickly. We're going to go to getws1.com. Download and install hub. And just follow the process, right? Anybody can do this. Anybody that's ever installed an app can do this. And, and again, the credentials they need, right, is, is usually email, right? So this is um, why you're seeing a lot of change today with user formats. We've had all sorts of user formats over, you know, the last, I mean, over decades, right? Uh, my dad started IBM in 1952, so we could say seven decades, I suppose. Uh, whether it's a short form of a username, you know, some weird numeric code that had nothing to do with anything. Um, and today that's why we're unifying, right, the user formatting on email so that all of these systems that we're talking about, all right, and, and every digital workspace solution is going to have multiple partner solutions to where that has um, the same format. And again, remember what's key here is user alignment. Making sure that that user credential that gets passed in a SAML process or whatever it is, right, is the same across uh, all systems. So, you know, that's really all I say about onboarding because any business, if you had time and planning, you know, is going to come up with what method works, right? And it's probably going to be one of these types of staging depending on the device. But many times, um, if we say don't really return to what we might call normal, Right, we've already seen that where a lot of businesses are saying, you know, we never really took seriously um, the, the way that we could work remotely. We we're just making everybody come in, right? Uh, old school thinking. But we found that we can work. And in fact, in some cases, we've been more productive and we've been able to do more because uh, my end users are a lot happier, right? They can take a couple hours off if they need to do something uh, with kids at school or, or go pick up their parents, right? Or take their parents or grandparents to the doctor, whatever it is, because I can work and make up that time later on. In fact, it's been proven people that work remotely usually work more hours than they did uh, in the office and they're more productive because they say, I've got two hours to get this done and they're focused and not distracted by, you know, going to the break room or somebody coming to talk to you. And I just have a very focused time of uh, two hours. If you focus two, three hours, I'll guarantee you get way more work done than you did sitting in office eight hours every day. Um, so, you know, again, I don't have to do that. And there's this whole idea too, if we, we don't need to be domain joined anymore. I can completely manage everything with UEM without being domain joined. Now, you know, we don't want to set up, upset the apple cart too much. We know we have our security folks that are steeply, uh, deeply rooted in the things that they want to do, All right? Okay. You know, we can be domain joined. Um, we can do all these sorts of things, even remote, right? This is the whole idea of what we talked about before of having access to Azure. You can do a remote domain join if you needed to. 
right? But that's not a requirement. I can manage everything with you, Ian, without that. But that's what I said. We're giving you the solution to where you can really address every single use case. So whatever it is, whatever you need to do, whatever you need to provide for your end users, um, there's a way to do it. And of course, this method, which I'll just call self-service, Once again, really good example that came out of COVID. Take some of those banks and other entities that we talked about that didn't even have laptops for some of their workers. We could say, hey, um, do you mind using your personal laptop? You know, I'll, I'll give you some kind of stipend. I'll buy you something new. I'll, I'll you know, go out and buy whatever you want, but in, you know, maybe you couldn't leave the house for a couple of weeks. Um, can you use your personal uh, laptop in that point in time? It even allows you to do that. And of course, they could just unenroll it when they get done if they wanted to, or maybe use their old one for work and uh, the stipend they got for the new one, maybe use that as their new home laptop, whatever. There's a million solutions you can come up with with this, and, and that's what's really cool. But one other thing we wanna talk about here, um, just to kind of wrap things up, is bringing together um, just about everything that we talked about today. And that is utilizing intelligence and carbon black. All right, so we've got um, UEM, we've got access inside our workspace one, we've got intelligence. Right, and of course, what's happening here is that we are pulling um, the log files from UEM. We have carbon black, integrated into intelligence, right? And, and again, really where all this comes in is that I've got an endpoint and I did a, a separate session on intelligence um, and where I really just uh, deep dived into this whole thing. But I like to bring this up kind of in every workspace one discussion that I have because, you know, it's kind of hard to make uh, a use case for intelligence sometime because of the cost. But really, when you're talking about security and the fact that you're using two or three other tools, when you pull all that together, uh, the cost decision then kind of goes out the window because um, you're going to pay one way or the other. And uh, many times this might be the same or a cheaper solution, but dealing with um, compliance and, and, uh, and all sorts of mitigation, uh, it really becomes uh, a tool that you have to have. So we've got our endpoint, right, which is being managed by UEM. And for whatever reason, right, we've got a, we've got a compliance issue here. So this compliance issue, right, could be a whole range of things. It could be a security issue, it could be a virus, it could be just it's missing a patch. Um, pulling the whole thing together. Remember that I can have sensors now that I configure in intelligence and sensors target If I could spell. Sensors target specific conditions, right? So these aren't a lot of the built-in things. These are things that are very customizable. All right, it's a PowerShell. Uh, it's rigged for Windows 10 today. There's the most development on Windows 10 because we've been managing that endpoint the longest from a laptop perspective, right? But these things will continue to uh, evolve as the product matures and we get more experience. But from intelligence point of view, I can monitor the standard things. We can monitor specific conditions with sensors. Carbon black, right, is just another sensor. So now I can report on a variety of things, whatever it is. And then of course, what that's going to do, right, whether that's coming from carbon black, telling me to kick off an automation um, based off security issue, or maybe it's from a sensor, right, whatever way, it doesn't matter. This is going to tell UEM now to fire off that automation 
to fix my endpoint. So we're just fixing everything behind the scenes. It makes us a totally proactive solution. And as I said, that's the whole reason of managing um, these endpoints and onboarding these endpoints in the first place. All right, so like I said, I think that was way more than 10 uh, tips and tricks, but we'll go back to our slides now. We've got a few things we wanna just finish up with. And uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining me for this session. A few things just to wrap up with here uh, from VMware Education. Make sure you always uh, take a look at the course catalog, right? Classes are changing constantly and new courses are being created um, all the time, which is uh, not true. 20 years ago when I started, we had a handful of classes, right? And they rarely change. But uh, today, uh, quarter by quarter, there's always things that are being updated. All right, we got a lot of discounts and uh, special offers going on um, here for this virtual VMworld uh, 2020. So pay attention to that. And there's a lot of great things here we can save some money um, off uh, some of the exams in particular. Um, please complete the survey, right? We want to know uh, what we can do better, what kind of sessions that uh, you like, if we didn't cover something you wanted to cover. And uh, again, please take a little bit of time um, to do that. Once again, my name is Joel West. I'm a cloud solutions architect at Hydra 1303. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining me for this session.